Hello and welcome to Inside Games, the only show on the internet where both hosts definitely have their sub feeds off. Today we're saying hello and goodbye to a near and dear friend of the show, Anthem. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, we just wouldn't have that, oh, we're doing gaming news again feeling without uh, Anthem to ride into YouTube views. So let's take it away. So we came back just in time to stuff Anthem into a boat, set it on fire, and kick it out to sea. So let's give our troubled friend a proper send off. In a letter posted to the Bioware blog this Wednesday, February 24th, Bioware Austin executive producer Christian Daly states that, quote, we've made the difficult decision to stop our new development work on Anthem, aka Anthem Next. We will, however, continue to keep the Anthem live service running as it exists today. Yes, that's good news, right? Both of Anthem's active players can keep playing. No, oh, zing, we got him again. <laughs> <sighs> it's... We gotta do it because it's it's the internet and you have to snark a little bit, but this is, you know, it's sad news. A lot of dreams it is, died. It is sad. It is really sad, yeah. Yeah, uh, but it's, you know, and, and honestly, at this point, it's probably a matter of time until the live service is closed down too. There can't be that many active players left. There weren't that many a week after the game came out, so... Mm. So it's a swing and a miss for the studio that created some of our favorite RPGs ever. Knights of the Old Republic, Dragon Age, Mass Effect, tons more from Bioware. And that's why people are starting to get a little antsy. Previous years have Bioware fans concerned about the future of the company with rafts of departures, stories of internal turmoil, and mismanagement, and now a AAA flop unlike the company's ever produced before. Yeah, can they find their way back to making the amazing RPGs of their past, or did Anthem put Bioware in the dirt? Once and for all. Now you see that title's not all clickbait. It's just mostly clickbait. So before we get into the huge issues facing the developer at large, let's recap what happened with Anthem real quick, just to cover the news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Anthem launched in February 2019, and immediately everyone knew something wasn't quite right with this game. Viewers were unimpressed with scores bouncing between the 5 to 7 range in critical reviews. Yeah, Games Radar's Sam Leverage summarized it pretty well in saying, quote, Anthem is ultimately severely flawed and very unfinished. There's half a good game in there, but it doesn't do enough to diminish the overall feeling of emptiness and repetition. Yeah, on top of that, the game had some severe technical problems, especially on PC. One of the only video games to ever actually blue screen my PC when I was playing it. <laughs> that, I, I, honestly, that has very rarely happened on any PC that I've had with any, any game. Anthem did it, though. So it runs bad and it plays bad, but maybe people bought it and it earned money, so there's a silver lining there. No, 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 no. It's part of an investor earnings report. EA CEO Andrew Wilson noted that the launch of Anthem did not meet our expectations, which they had actually pinned at five to six million units in another investor call just before the game came out earlier that year. They did not hit that goal. So that's a whoops. That's a whoopsie. Uh, Bioware quickly reminded everyone, though, that they are absolutely committed to the game and that this is just the beginning. Yeah, on launch day, former Bioware Austin studio director Chad Robertson took to the Bioware blog to let you know that, quote, Anthem's launch represents a commitment we're making to you. We're just getting started. That was true then, uh, but the fixes didn't come fast enough or, or, or really at all, really. I mean, there, there were some quality of life and bug fixes and stuff. We don't want to be too dismissive. No, sure. I mean, obviously, they've been working on it for years. Uh, in March 2019, former Bioware general manager Casey Hudson, get used to hearing the word former, <laughs> More on that in a second. Uh, posted the first post-launch update that fittingly begins with, whew. <laughs> the note, quote, can't emphasize enough how much we appreciate you staying with us and tease us upcoming events like, quote, the Cataclysm later this spring. Oh, Cataclysm, that sounds really cool. I don't think it was that impressive. Like, you think Cataclysm, you imagine, oh, it must be like a swirly vortex of, of like lightning bolts and dinosaurs. Like, I think the, the sky just changed color a little bit. I don't know, I'm speaking out my ass. And then the ambulance chaser caught up to the wagon. <laughs> yeah, in April 2019, Jason Schreier published, quote, how Bioware's anthem went wrong. One of his postmortems that from the anonymous accounts of a handful of people people seeks to accurately recreate the work rigors of hundreds of people in a very complicated work environment. Snark aside, the accounting here does seem believable with Schreier's image of Bioware being one where management didn't really know how to organize work teams to hit goals effectively and everyone ignoring warning signs, assuming everything would turn out right in the end because it always had before. The article referenced this repeated phrase called Bioware magic. This communal belief that since development had been troubled in the past and those games turned out fine, that everything's probably going to be fine with Anthem because it's the same problems we're running into in the same ways. And it was fine before, so why wouldn't it be fine now? You and I have worked at uh, multiple companies that this sounds very, very, <laughs> very similar to where it's like, well, we were successful yeah. before. Why won't we be successful now? We just do the same thing in the same environment. Same thing going to happen. No, that's not, a, that's not a real thing. It, it gets there when there's a layer of abstraction between management and the people who organize the labor and then the knowledge and fundamental understanding of the product itself. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and in our cases, we have worked for a lot of media companies that don't really understand what works about media. They just see it as a product with numbers associated with it and think that you can manipulate it like a product. And you can for a while. But yeah, this, this very much speaks to there was a layer of middle management or even executive management at BioWare that didn't understand the sacrifices and hard work it actually took to make the games. They just said, well, everything right. looks the same from my end, so why should we worry? And after that bit of drama, life continued on with BioWare supposedly working to fix the game, but not showing a lot of progress. In June 2019, EA CEO Andrew Wilson admitted in an interview with GameDaily.biz that the game's attempt to marry BioWare's story with action-adventure gameplay uh, was, quote, not working very well. Wilson again reiterated EA's and Bioware's commitment to the property, though, saying that, quote, uh, that team is really going to get there with something special and something great because they've demonstrated that they can. So they can do it now because they've done it before? Sounds a little bit like that Bioware magic's floating in the air. Hmm. September 2019, another update from Chad Robertson announced that the game is, quote, moving away from the axe structure for updates and instead will move to seasonal updates. That is until... <laughs> yeah, until February 2020, when Casey Hudson announced that they're going to, quote, move away from full seasons as the team works towards the future of Anthem. So no more seasons or really content updates of any kind. Got it. And the same post, Hudson announces that rather than focus on quality of life improvements or new content, they're, quote, focusing on a longer term redesign of the experience, specifically working to reinvent the core gameplay loop with clear goals, motivating challenges and progression with meaningful rewards. So after an entire year of post-launch support, they're finding that even the game's core systems need adjusting and reworking. Yowza. It's also February 2020, so that's when COVID swept through and started creating its problems. Our next update landed in May of 2020 when Christian Daly revealed that the current team on Anthem only had about 30-ish developers and that they were in the prototyping phase, quote, earning our way forward as we set out to hit our first major milestone goals. Yeah, those descriptions make it sound like they're just starting a game, not necessarily salvaging what's already there and working. Signs don't really look good here, and they really haven't since the game's launch, but still, Ian Bioware is saying the whole while that they're sticking to it and they believe in the project. All the while, high-profile developers trickled out of Bioware in December 2020. Two very well-known developers, Bioware General Manager Casey Hudson and Dragon Age executive producer Mark Dara, both announced their departures. Uh, in Hudson's case, it was the second time he left Bioware. <laughs> And that more or less drops us where we are right now. Uh, following a rumored review by Electronic Arts, Bioware has announced they're abandoning development on the Anthem reboot and maintaining the game as it is now. In the post, Bioware Austin executive producer Christian Daly specifically notes that, quote, not everything we had planned as a studio before COVID-19 can be accomplished without putting undue stress on our teams. Yeah, I mean, COVID, COVID's impacted everybody. We're shooting this stupid video uh, miles apart. You know, we've all had to try to find ways to compensate and that takes time and it puts an impact on things and, I think the way they phrased it is totally reasonable. There's heightened awareness of the work culture around game developers now. Uh, some some exposés on crunch uh, from Rockstar Games and, and Blizzard and most recently uh, CD Projekt have a lot of the, you know, us, us hardcore gamers sort of bellowing about how we want developers to be treated humanely. So if they're going to shelve Anthem next and say that they're doing it to preserve developer work culture, it's kind of hard to argue with that. You could probably summarize this entire Anthem ordeal with Christian Daly's eloquent statement, game development is hard. So in the end, the project was just beyond saving. You know, if something's gonna experiment, it's gonna be a new IP, sometimes it just doesn't work out. That's the nature of experimentation. At the end of it though, it seemed like everyone made the best faith moves they possibly could. Uh, Bioware pledged to fix it and spent two years trying to do it. That's uncommon. Uh, Electronic Arts tolerated them spending that money, which is very, very rare. Probably knowing it wouldn't go anywhere. Imagine kind of being EA and seeing Bioware spin their wheels on this thing. It's arguably your job to get in there, make them work on more effective projects as they're just blowing millions of dollars. But EA would absolutely look like the bad guy if they went in and stopped it. But I mean, this is the internet. We got to get mad at somebody, Lawrence. Eh, we could get mad at EA, but life's messy. And we don't have the full story. We don't have the answers, but that's not fun for internet journalism. Who cares? Uh, the bigger narrative here is Bioware as a developer in general. Lots of people have extreme fondness for the developer. Thanks to some amazing output. The games we talked about earlier in the last two decades. Uh, Knights of the Old Republic, Dragon Age, Mass Effect, to name a few. Yeah, so they had one bad game. Just one bad game. What's the problem? Sometimes people make bad game. They, they're fine. Let's keep going. Uh, it's more that this bad game lands in a string of concerning developments for Bioware. All right. Okay, fine. But did Anthem kill Bioware? <laughs> all right. Come well, on. We the got actual quick reason is that Lawrence is kind of a dork for all this stuff. Drank some really good coffee, which I know Lawrence loves. Uh, so let's take a look at Bioware, shall we? 2003, Bioware made Knights of the Old Republic. 
Yay! I love that game. It was so good. And then 2007, they made Mass Effect. People love that game. Wow! You could have sex in space! It was great. It was great. And they were acquired by EA. But, I, but that's okay, though, because in 2009, they made Dragon Age Origins. Yeah! I love Dragon Age Origins! It's one of the best computer RPGs, CRPGs ever. 2011, Bioware released Dragon Age 2. <laughs> oh, it was so bad. It was so bad. I... I I'm 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 pretty pretentious, right? But most of the time when I play a game, I don't get insulted. But uh -huh. when I played Dragon Age 2, I was kind you of were insulted. insulted. I was. Dragon Age Origins was a huge, important, big game. Dragon Age 2 was a button masher with like almost nothing to it. Oof. It was it was it was almost thematically the opposite of the first game, and there's a reason why. Everyone hates EA nowadays, and honestly, they have for the last 20 years, and it was specifically because of moves like this. Uh, EA had a shitty habit of scooping up good developers, mandating certain revenue-based gameplay mechanics, and then basically ruining everything we love. They did it with Battle, Battle, Star Wars Battlefront 2, and I hated it. I hated what they did. I was so I was so pissed that EA did that. Yeah, the, over about 20 years, it was just the same shit over and over again. Oh, you like expensive single-player games? Mantra transactions. <laughs> well, how, what about the developers you love? They're all closed. Uh, what about those nachos you're about to eat? We slathered them in sour cream. Man, I love sour cream. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> oh, that was a bit of a me. risk. I don't like sour cream on my nachos, so maybe some people would be okay with that. <laughs> yeah, and so here's EA at the doorstep of our beloved RPG maker. Bioware's output, you know, big, story-rich, single-player games were completely anathema to EA at the time. Um, and this was when EA was really starting to shift gears. Uh, they were starting to see massive revenues from FIFA Ultimate Team, which had launched with FIFA 09. And they wanted to convert all their properties into that kind of cash cow. You can kind of see them still doing this a little bit. They're finally backing off. It only took them 10 years. I think it took Battlefront 2, to be honest with you. I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back for them. And they were like, all right. And so, according to former Dragon Age creative director Mike Laidlaw, when it came to the sequel to one of the biggest single-player RPGs ever made, EA gave the team a whopping 14 months to put it together. Yeah, Laidlaw recalls, quote, I tell other people that and they get all blanched and go, oh my God, are you okay? As near as we can tell, 2011's Dragon Age 2 is the game where it kind of all started to go wrong. Uh, EA mandates an outrageous turnaround time, which the team hits, but to their detriment and to the detriment of the brand in general. You know, it wasn't like EA came in and flipped a big switch on the wall from good to bad in Bioware HQ. Uh, Bioware went on to make more titles that found an audience and managed to satisfy fans. Yeah, 2011's Star Wars The Old Republic is still operating to this day, uh, though admittedly that came from Bioware's newer Austin studio and not the Edmonton office that is responsible for the classics. That's correct, yeah. 2012's Mass Effect 3 launched with a fair amount of controversy. Uh, people were mad at the ending, but it, as far as I'm concerned, it was just pure servile trash. Uh, didn't didn't say anything interesting, just there to, to pat everyone on the head and let you bang whatever space person you wanted to. I guess that's what Mass Effect's always been about, so I don't know who I'm kidding, but... And, uh, not to mention that Mass Effect 3 included a multiplayer mode to get that microtransaction money starting to flow a little bit. That's that EA hand reaching in there. And then the game that really seems to be the full turning point, 2014's Dragon Age Inquisition. Yeah, this is the weird thing. From the outside, this game is the one that seemed like it got Bioware back on track. Yeah, it was a huge story-rich single-player game that, yes, still had a multiplayer mode because EA probably, it reviewed well, it sold well, so... Hooray! But Schreier's 2019 expose on Bioware painted a completely different picture. One in which management was largely still directionless and individual developers were left to crunch to make up the difference. Yeah, an anonymous developer stated that, quote, some of the people in Edmonton were so burnt out and that they needed Dragon Age Inquisition to fail in order for people to realize that this isn't the right way to make games. I, I think you and I have been in that position before, too. Absolutely. Just, like, just Absolutely. let this fail so they stop asking us to do it. What's worse is when it yeah. half fails and then people can find metrics that make it seem like it didn't. So they tell you to keep it. Oh, mm -hmm. I hate it. Uh, so yeah, the problem is Inquisition didn't fail. It reviewed well, it sold well, and that's the problem. Yeah, so since it worked with Inquisition, well, why wouldn't it work again with Anthem? Magic. It obviously didn't. And now Bioware is in a rough spot. Uh, it lucked its way through one trouble development project, but not through a second. Yeah, the huge problem is that gap of time. Both Inquisition and Anthem's development represents about a decade of the company. Uh, That's an outrageous amount of time to be stuck operating in flawed management structures and burning out your workforce. Take it from me. I have seen this happen, and I've also been a manager, and you can... Watching 10 years of development down the drain like that? That's terrible. So while it is tempting to say that a change in management ethos could put Bioware back on the right track, 
it's really not that trivial to just swap out the work culture or the management culture of an entire company. That's hundreds of people who have been operating in a given environment for a long time. You don't just flip that overnight. Yeah, the way I see that is like, you have a really bad habit and somebody else sees that you have a bad habit, but they're like, ah, don't worry about it. It'll take care of itself. But you let it go for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Eventually that person has got the worst habit in the world. And you're like, well, how do we break it out of it? You, you can't, the, the yeah. answer is you can't. Uh, so what talent you had has either burned out or left and an awful lot of people have left Bioware. Yeah, it's, and it's easy to see why. Unfortunately, once a culture of corporate overwork pervades the workplace, you either slip into it and burn yourself out mentally, uh, generating money for some other jerk who doesn't even know your name, or you become an in inactive employee. You sort of mentally check out. Now it's a nine to five. And uh, it seems like it's very difficult to make games with a nine to five attitude these days. Luckily, there's, you know, people are trying to explore it and figure it out, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's intoxicating to work on something huge when you own it or it's new territory, but then you're kind of expected to flip around and grind out huge game two. <laughs> and then you gotta have to make huge game three in half the time. So also someone else can make an ass load of money. It's just, it's, it's the worst. Yeah, so you're like, why am I here? What am I doing? Uh, the dream is gone. So you leave uh, and trickling departures kind of makes sense to Bioware in that context. All right, so it was, EA that killed Bioware, Lawrence? Who was it who killed Bioware? Pretty easy to point to exploitative management on EA's part there, or specifically their desire to try to squeeze more revenue out of already succeeding products. That's mostly what people point a finger to them for. But again, this was a long time ago, uh, and EA seemed to be awful friendly when it came to giving Anthem the runway it needed to eventually skid off the edge of the runway and crash. Well, is, is Bioware dead or not? I clicked on some clickbait. You better deliver, Lawrence. Okay, uh, how about this? The creative team that made all the Bioware games you like is no longer together or working in Bioware. So the Bioware that you think about is dead, but there's still a company called Bioware there and they're still working on some of the brands you really, really like. It's uh, it's really easy to blame EA for this. And and I think EA does, you know, as much as a, you know, two letters can, can shoulder blame. Um, EA's direction does, did kind of directly point to some decline in quality in Bioware products at a certain window of time. But the bigger, broader thing here is that creative teams very rarely stay together making the same quality creative output for their entire careers. You know, people come together and drift apart for personal, professional, or monetary reasons. There's nothing to say that if Bioware, like Bioware chose to be acquired for one, let's remember that. And then for two, uh, there's nothing saying that like, if they had stayed independent, they wouldn't have drifted apart in the same way. Maybe a little less dramatic, maybe a little less uh, violent, but who's to say? Sometimes it's just the way it goes. Not sometimes, most of the time. Uh, but what about the Bioware we know now? Is it possible the company could take up the RPG mantle and create games that equal or even surpass the studio's previous output? It's a really good question and one that I'm hoping for. Uh, the company as it is now is kind of in a weird spot, at least from our perspective. You know, we'll never have total clarity because we can't see the books <laughs> and we shouldn't. <laughs> that would be illegal, maybe? But anyway. Uh, yeah, it kind of feels, honestly, it feels really similar to where Blizzard's at as a company. Uh, it still gets attention based off its legacy titles and its remasters, but it has a lot of management churn and it can't seem to output games at the pace they used to. It's kind of like development paralysis. So what's next for Bioware, the company that aside from Anthem has only made Dragon Age and Mass Effect games for the past 13 years? Well, Bruce, hold on to your hat because it's another Dragon Age and another Mass Effect. Bioware teased Dragon Age 4 at the 2018 Gaming Awards and there really has not been a peep since. <laughs> Nobody's heard anything. And they teased another Mass Effect project in December 2020, so fairly recently. Yeah, neither game has gameplay footage, release window, much of anything really. Uh, granted, that could change at a moment's notice, uh, but it doesn't feel great to be two years after their last major release, Anthem, and only have vague teasers to see what's next. So, yeah, yeah to be fair, they do have Mass Effect Legendary Edition coming out this spring, but, but do remasters count? Do they? I guess they do. So that's kind of where we're at. Bioware's last new IP flopped pretty hard, cost them years of maintenance to no real benefit, and now their next release is still years away. So maybe luckily they can slap that remaster button for some emergency funding <laughs> to keep them going, but that's not a new game. Yeah, maybe we'll see a full gameplay demo of Dragon Age 4 this summer with a fall 2021 release. That's about the most accelerated timeline you could expect at this point. Um, yeah, I, I'm not expecting that at all. I'm just saying it's possible. Uh, you know, maybe it'll look awesome. It'll be a big chonkity ass single player RPG that everyone will play over 150 hours and all love it. 
and then we'll all be cosplaying and doing our fan art and writing our fan fiction and it'll be great we're gonna be high-fiving running to our computers look up guides on how to bang the big titted it's less demon we can find times will be good it'll be just like our youth lawrence <laughs> But our read uh, is that, at, unfortunately, right now, Bioware is a little bit paralyzed. Um, it can be very, very difficult, sometimes impossible, to shock a company out of not working or overworking. Um, it's kind of two two sides of the same bad spectrum. Uh, or to, you know, restore everyone's faith in management that has previously overworked and ignored them. You can actually see that process happening at Blizzard right now, with Activision starting to directly rearrange the executive structure. So in February 2020, Blizzard hired Rod, the closer Ferguson, as executive producer of the Diablo franchise, presumably because for some reason Blizzard can't even ship Diablo Immortal after announcing it three years ago. <laughs> Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones. Phone, right? uh, so if you're unfamiliar, Ferguson is the guy that got Bioshock Infinite out the door in 2013, after that game had been stuck in development since 2008. Uh, it could have been a, it could have been convenient timing, but you know, come on. He joined Irrational. He only spent six months there. It was just to get Infinite shipped, and then he moved on to another company. So since then, he kind of had a reputation of just sort of being a producer that could come in and get projects done. And that's probably why he went to Blizzard. Yeah, even more drastically, Activision recently merged a whole ass other business unit into Blizzard. Yeah, Activision Blizzard had confirmed that news to GamesIndustry.biz last month. Yeah, uh, Vicarious Visions has been a reliable pinch hitter for Activision for years, cranking out profitable titles like Clockwork. Uh, in the aughts, they largely handled ports of Activision properties like Guitar Hero on the Wii or Transformers on the Nintendo DS. Mm -hmm. I, I was used to seeing their logo pop up on things because they would release four or five titles a year. And since I tried to play as much as I can, be like, hey, VV's back, all right. Uh, they later gained a little more heat uh, for the daring and profitable Skylanders series, which actually outsold Disney Infinity, according to a 2016 CNBC report. But nobody in our little gamer circles really knew about them until they did the excellent remaster of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 last fall, uh, which a lot of people remember, just in time to be dissolved into another business unit. <laughs> It was so crazy. Like every because of Tony Hawk, everyone started being like, "Yeah, Vicarious Visions, they're good." And I was like, "Great! I love it when developers that no one knows about finally gets acknowledged." Kind of like Raven Software, um, and then immediately got dissolved. That oh, was a bummer. They finally started getting a little, a little glow up for all their good work. On paper, we have one developer that can absolutely crank out product, and another developer that seemingly forgot how to ship. So. Maybe if we just mush them together, we'll get a video game sandwich, right, Lawrence? Is that the way it works? Yeah, I I hope so. The problem is I, I don't know of many cases where that has worked. Um, mostly because I don't think we've seen developers go through this life cycle completely yet. Go to the point where they just get so big and so flush with cash that they kind of stop working or they lose that production fire, or they never had the middle of management to keep it stoked in the first place. So how do you get it back after you've lost it? Most Most companies just shut down. So it'll be really interesting to see if that can come back. Um, there is actually one example of a company that is in the late stages of having a bit of a renaissance, and that's Square Enix. Oh yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it's funny because I I remember in the middle like middle 2010s, I remember thinking Square Enix was like Ugh, trash. People talking so bad about Final Fantasy, and then Final Fantasy 14 is kind of commonly referenced as a redemption story because the ripple effects inside Square Enix are still happening. Uh, the same producer. Uh, Naoki Yoshida was made the director of Final Fantasy 16, so it's clear the company saw his method on Final Fantasy 14, reaped the benefits, then sought to reproduce it. For a long time, I've seen video game producers try to tell the world about how important their jobs are. I think uh, we're finally starting to see development studios get to the size and certainly the tenure. We're having a really solid production staff that can go around and organize all the labor efficiently and directly is so, so important. And that's why Naoki Yoshida is kind of Square Enix's golden boy. Not only did he turn around a single project, but now they're putting him in charge of multiple projects to sort of sprinkle his organizational magic across all of them to the tune of giving him his own numbered Final Fantasy, which, you know, within Square, that's a pretty big deal. So it can happen. It is happening right now with Square. But then again, they're probably the only living example that I can think of. And just like that, Square went from releasing maybe two games a, a decade to now releasing one game every year, every other year or so. So their output has jumped drastically because they were able to reorganize their workforce. Yeah, I mean, Activision is trying the same thing with the production power of uh, Vicarious Visions, and they obviously want to utilize it to make better use of their asset. So if Bioware can do the same, uh, then they can absolutely flourish and we'll be cheering them along all the way. Absolutely. So as we say goodbye to Anthem, we should also say goodbye to the Bioware we once knew. All of us, right now, let's all get together. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all just just send them off. It's no big deal. We do hold in our hearts hope for a new 
Bioware, like a phoenix <laughs> coming out of the ashes to make better games. Whether they're called Bioware or something else, there are hardworking creative people making games exactly like that all over the place right now. So in the interest of uh, playing, happy, playing games and being happy now versus being sad about the ones you can't play anymore in the past, may we suggest these games for that classic Bioware RPG feel. Yeah, so uh, Lawrence, you said anything from Spiders. Spy like Pillars okay. Of Pillars of Eternity, Divinity and Original Sin. Those are the ones I would recommend before anything from Spiders. So Pillars of Eternity is kind of more your Baldur's Gate throwback. Divinity Original Sin, maybe more of your Dragon Age Origins throwback, if that's what you're into. Spiders is a weird European RPG maker. They make kind of, <laughs> yeah, they, they make a series of weird and unrefined experimental RPGs. Uh, let's look up a let's look up a few of them. I'm not just gonna recommend. Uh, it's in early access right now and has been for a while. Baldur's Gate Three. Uh, oh, that yeah. was fun. I I played it and really enjoyed it. And they're still they're still working on it. Yeah, from uh, from Larian, the make uh, the yeah. creators of uh, Divinity Original Sin. So Spiders uh, has they did of Orcs and Men, Mars War Logs, which I think may have made it into a uh, <laughs> a gameplay back in the day. Yeah, it had the did it have the shirt that just had Mars and the, whatever. Um, Bound by Flame, The Technomancer, most recently Greedfall in 2019. These are the kind of games that like if you if you have that one dorky friend who's hyper into the like mid-tier PC thing, they may have tried to tell you to play one of these games and you may have ignored them as quickly as you possibly could have. So I can be that friend now. Maybe go check out Greedfall if you want something that's kind of weird and off the beaten path, but has that really kind of late 90s PC RPG feeling to it. Um, point is, there's a lot of games out there that still offer that experience. It would be a shame if we all spent our times dwelling on the past instead of throwing money and adulation to the people making that happen right now. Man, Lawrence, that is just good advice in general for life. <laughs> just really good advice. And on that note, as we head boldly into the weekend, may you head boldly into some sweet video games and we'll catch you next time on Inside Games. Oh crap, I forgot! You have to give us money first! What? Oh, the... <laughs> <laughs> the Patreon. Yeah, I didn't even script <laughs> it. So, the Patreon. Uh, yeah, uh, we have a uh, we have Patreon now. That's it. There's actually no other news at all. There's no tears. There's no rewards. There's no nothing. We just put it up, and if you guys want to throw money at it, you can. Uh, you know, we're going to use it to fuel the show. But we are so early in producing the show and figuring out our direction with it that we don't That's have right. like a full roadmap for you. So, if you don't want to throw money at something that doesn't have a roadmap, then don't do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, that, that, that's to that's totally fine with us. But if you do, then we'll obviously use it to grow that Patreon and actually add more tiers and things like that as this uh, as this brand mm -hmm. gets bigger yeah. and bigger. No promises, but the more money there is, the easier it is to spend more time making more cool things. So I'll just leave that there. And all you have to do, if you don't want to do any of that, is just watch. So thank you for watching. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>